Good morning, everybody. Who recognised that tune? A mighty fortress. Guess why we're singing that one today? It was the one, one of the ones written by Martin Luther, and he is the person who we'll be looking at today in our third Sunday of our Cloud of Witnesses series. I welcome you all here in the room today, everyone who's watching in their own homes. God is good. And if ever there was a reason to say that out loud, it is on a day where we reflect on the legacy, legacy of Martin Luther. You'll hear a bit more about that, but for now, let's stand together and sing together one of the legacies of Luther, congregational singing. We stand and sing together about the Christ in whom we all have faith in Christ alone. Let's stand and sing. alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God. In helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died. Light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stayed.
Good Father, God of love, God of righteousness and God of mercy, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that we can know who you are because we can hear your word and allow it to do its holy work in us. We thank you, God, that because of Jesus, we have life. Because of Jesus, we can know that nothing will ever stand between you and us, that your love will make it through to us, and that because of your love, our way towards you is cleared of all stumbling blocks. We thank you, God, that because of your spirit of truth, of goodness and of clarity, we can know that as we stand or sit or walk before you, we are your beloved ones. Thank you, God, God of mercy, God of love, God of righteousness and goodness for calling us back this morning to be your children and to bask in the glory of your goodness. We love being here. May all that we do this morning bring a smile to your face. In the name of Jesus, we pray all of these things. Amen. And we're going to sing now, Our Mighty Fortress is Our God. And as we do, I invite any of you who would like to come forward and to start building a fortress today. Quite obvious, right? It's not, it's not a big stretch of the imagination. We've got a pile of Bibles here. This is me showing off all the Bibles I have. Um, but use them to build a fortress as well. Let's build a fortress on the word of God, the word of God. If you don't want to build, let us sing together. Our my true fortress is our God.
Good morning. If I can ask James, what is the title? Sorry, what is the title over the music of that song? What is the name of that tune? Ein Festeburg, okay. That means in German a mighty fortress. But I've got an answer. And there, the title of that tune is Worms, W O R M. Why would anyone call a tune worms? It has to do with the story of Martin Luther, who we're looking at today. Now, there is a thing that Martin Luther attended, a conference, which was to look into his conduct within the church, and it was at a place called Worms, W-O-R-M-S in Germany, and it was called a diet. So it was a diet of worms. Does that sound appetizing to anyone? No. You'd almost think they got that wrong, but no, that's what it's called. Now, talk about getting things wrong. How's up those who've ever had any, got anything wrong? Anyone? Maybe it's easy to say, how's up those who've never had anything wrong? Never got anything wrong? No hands up there. Well, well, what Martin Luther is famous for, well, quite a few things, but one is for telling the church, hey guys, there are a number of things in the way we run our church, the way we are our church, in which we can say we've got it badly wrong. Badly wrong. And one of those is, well, wherever it says repent, they thought it meant do penance. Now, you can tell straight away that if John the Baptist repent, not do penance, you know, and Jesus similarly, you know, there's a big difference between repent and do penance. And there are a number of other ways in which Luther had arguments with the church over what was wrong with the way they were doing their church. The way the Bible was translated, and so he did his own translation of the Bible later on. He was first a monk, then a priest, a, a theologian. He was an academic, a hymn writer, as we've just seen or heard, sung. He was a number of things. And amongst those things was he was a very deep Christian who put his life on the line for what he knew was right about what the church was getting wrong. And in the end, he was excommunicated and all that sort of stuff. And Martin Luther was very, very brave. One other little story I might tell you. Martin Luther and his wife, Katharina, very faithfully every day would do devotions. Well, on this particular day, Martin Luther read, read to Katharina and himself, uh, from Genesis chapter 22, which is the story of Cricket and... All right. It's the story of how Abraham was asked by God to sacrifice his son Isaac, his only son Isaac. Wow. Yes, yeah, that's pretty tough, isn't it? Pretty tough love there, you know. And of course, in the end... God didn't allow Abraham to go through with that deed that stayed his hand at the last moment so that he wouldn't kill his son on that altar. And as this was read, Katerina said to her husband, but Martin, God would never do that to his son, would he? And Martin said, oh, but he did, Katie, he did. On the hill of Golgotha. That is exactly what God did or allowed to happen to his son. And you might say, you might argue about, was that a sacrifice in this kind of sense? But we know what the result of that is. It's life, the resurrection, the life that God gives us. As we see every time we take communion and we do that, every Sunday here. 
So as we um, do communion this morning, I might ask the service to come up as I speak. And we know that Jesus was at a meal with his disciples. It was a Passover meal. And at this meal, at a certain time, a solemn moment, Jesus actually took a piece of bread and he broke it. He gave thanks. And he said to his disciples, take, eat, all of you. Eat some of this. Come on, guys. And as you do, let it remind you of my body broken for you. And after took the cup and again giving thanks, he said to them, look, drink from this, you guys, all of you, because I need you to do this whatever you drink, like this, to remember how my blood was poured out for you to the last drop to give you life, forgiveness of your sins. And they did. And we still do today. It is our custom here, as you receive the bread, that you eat it whenever it's your right time to do that. But to hold the second or the glass and we all drink it together at the end. So as we drink together, we are kind of commemorating Jesus. But you know, we're not commemorating a dead Jesus. We are commemorating the Jesus who died, rose again. Drink together. So let us pray. Martin Luther today, showing the church where it was wrong and suffering for it. But by now, much of the church has accepted much of what he said. And we thank you, Lord, for his way of showing it. And for the church that we belong to, which is following, to a large extent, in his footsteps. We pray for all your church, with all its differences and variety, diversity, and we pray that we would all be serving you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. The first reading today is Psalm 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn, Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people with equity. Good morning all. Good to see you here today. Uh, and good morning to everybody watching online as well. We're glad that you've joined with us today. And my name is Loris. I'm one of the elders here, and it's my uh, privilege to welcome you all and to invite you all to stay for a cup of tea or coffee afterwards, and um, we'll have a nice time of uh, getting to know people and catching up on what's been happening. So... Um, before we have our, our, all our slides this morning, we're going to have a, a time of uh, commissioning for our newest safe church contact person.
who is Janet, who's coming up now. And I have been asked to just give a, a very brief outline of the role of a safe church contact person. And uh, so I've got here the position description and the, um, the role involves being the primary point of contact for anyone concerned about issues relating to the safety of children and those of our congregation at risk, including vulnerable adults. Uh, so when we're talking about church safety, it's not just about children. It could be anybody really in the, in the church who may feel unsafe at any particular time. And Janet, along with David Lohman, have uh, volunteered and been interviewed and felt uh, qualified for the role uh, by Church Council and are now have been appointed as Safe Church contact people as being like a first point of contact for anybody in the congregation or involved with the congregation who may have a concern about safety about for themselves or for another person. And it's very important that the congregation knows who the Safe Church contact people are. And we're going to have posters around the building um, with uh, Janet and David's name on it so that people are aware. Now, David had a commissioning uh, before Christmas and now Janet, it's Janet's turn. Um, but just to be uh, aware that um, the role of the Safe Church contact person involves being on our safe church operating team. And uh, that's just to make you aware that there is a group of people who work very busily behind the scenes, um, reviewing our processes, reviewing the uh, policies that we are required to follow. We are required to um, be up to date with uh, the Victorian uh, guidelines and um, we're reviewing our, our um, programs all the time uh, to make sure that we're following those as well as the policies uh, of uh, Churches of Christ and the Uniting Church. So we've got a lot of documents to review <laughs> on Safe Church operating team. But um, it's a very important role. You may not be aware, but uh, th things are happening in the background to ensure safety uh, at Living Faith Church. And of course, if you have any concerns or questions or you'd like to know more, please feel free to talk with either Janet or David, or you could come to any of the elders or the minister, Ellen. I would be happy to speak with you as well. Safety is everybody's responsibility, isn't it, after all? So thank you for listening to that, a little out outline. But uh, Janet... <clears throat> Uh, is taking uh, over the role after we've had a, a retiring of Kate, Alistair and Carol have been our Safe Church contact people up until now. And so we thank them um, greatly. Let's give them a little round of applause because uh, they kind of paved the way and set up the structures of this role um, so that now Janet and David have a bit of a, a, a format to follow and, and a, a structure. Big shoes, Big shoes to fill maybe, but there's, they've set in place a structure and um, I'm sure that you're up for the task, Janet. So Janet has been a member of Living Faith Church for a long time and has been very faithful in her ministry here. Uh, I think most people would know Janet. Yes, I think if you don't know Janet, you should because she's a lovely person. <laughs> So um, she will be joining uh, the Safe Church operating team, as I said, and she will also be providing guidance to church council about how to implement uh, policy uh, to the best, um, the best way we can, uh, we can implement policy and helping us to promote the knowledge of and adherence to our Safe Church policy. So, um, yes, we, we thank you, Janet, for being willing to take on this role. And um, I'd like you to join me in prayer as Janet starts her role, her new role. And what I'd like, if you can remember, when I get to the end and I say, in Jesus' name, I'd like us all to say out loud, Amen, just so that Janet's aware that the, the church is, we're, as a collective, that we are all praying for her. And Ellen would like to be involved. <laughs> Okay, just take a step closer to me so that I'm near the microphone too. <laughs> Thank you. 
and we pray together. Dear Lord God, thank you for Janet, who with David has agreed to be a safe church contact person at Living Faith Church. We acknowledge that you have prepared Janet for this role and called her to it. We now pray that you will provide her with your wisdom and discernment, your grace, your mercy and your love as she fulfills this role. We as a congregation uphold Janet and David in prayer today and in the future. We pray you will bless them and bless your church. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Thank you, Janet and Ellen. Okay. Uh, we've got... Oh, did something fall down? <laughs> I was going to comment that it does look like a mighty fortress, doesn't it? It's a little little weaker now that Ellen just took the, one of the Bibles away, but <laughs> she must need it. Um Okay, so community news. Thank you. Oh, um, Church Life with Graham Harrison, this lovely book. I brought mine along just to show you that I started reading it and I love flicking through it and looking back and looking at photos. It's a, a really great memento to have of Graham's time with us. So do have a chat to Paul today if you haven't got one and you've been meaning to get one um, or email him if you don't see him today. And All Saints are having a kids' club. Uh, that's this week, isn't it? Has any, anybody going? Yes. We have one person going down there. We might get a little bit of a report sometime from you then, Aaron. So the kids' program is this coming week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I think. So Getting Connected has some details. Uh, yeah, except we haven't got Getting Connected today, but there might be a flyer there. Now, Jan is here to talk to us about Packs for Backs. The backpacks are, can be left any time now, from now on for the next month. Uh, if you leave them in the foyer as you come in, then we can collect them and um, pack them. <clears throat> also, I've had a request from Mission Liaison. They um, are wanting children's books for children age five to 12 years. And they're wanting these books as a library. They teach the children to read, but they want to inspire the children to enjoy reading. And so all books that are suitable for children between eight and 12 years would be given a second life. If you're having a clean out and you want to give us some books, well, we would be, we'll pass them on when we do the backpacks. There'll be a box in the foyer uh, from next week that you can put any uh, books suitable for children five to 12 years, and they'll be greatly appreciated. I know when the people came back from Vanuatu, they were absolutely horrified at the books, the, amount, the lack of books in the library then, and the condition of books. They said they really needed books. And we have sent some over the last few years, but we want to make a concerted effort this year. Thank you for your help. Yes, thanks, Jen. We might remember that uh, Vanuatu had a number of cyclones recently where you know, maybe books have been destroyed because of weather. So, yes, that would be well, well received, I'm sure. Okay, it's happening. The um, church here is becoming modern. We've got air conditioning in the hall and uh, some of the other rooms as well. So um, just be aware that there might be workmen around the building uh, when you're coming um, in for our, our programs through the week. And, uh, yeah, we look forward to a bit of hot weather where we can turn them on. <laughs> and um, we would love to receive your comments, your feedback, your questions, or uh, just let us know um, your, who's watching online or who's um, coming along and uh, to our services, you can uh, email us at welcome at livingfaithchurch.org.au. And there will be prayer after the service today for anyone who would like personal prayer. Uh, so, uh, members of our prayer team will be down the front of the worship centre here. 
So just make your way to the front and someone will be available to pray with you. You may want to pray for yourself or for someone else. And uh, all prayers, of course, are confidential. And now we come to a time of corporate prayer where we will pray together. And um, the prayer I have this morning uh, was a little bit inspired by our psalm read to us by Kay. So will you pray with me now? We praise you, our God, today because of the marvellous things you have done. We remember that you have brought salvation to all people. All people who seek and find you will know your salvation. And we know that you will judge the world fairly with righteousness when the time is right. And we believe that you will bring equity to the world when your kingdom comes. We thank you that we can rely on you that we can know that you are a mighty fortress. Today we ask for faith. May you build faith in our lives so that we may know better your righteousness. Help us to live out our faith by following Christ's way. We pray that you will equip us Transform us and give us wisdom and a heart for service. Today we ask that you help us and the leaders of our church to understand that your kingdom is a place of equity where all are accepted just how we are. We yearn for safety both in our church and our local community and our homes, but also in places of conflict where innocent lives are being lost. We pray for peace in Gaza and Israel. We pray for peace in Ukraine and Russia. And we pray for peace in Sudan, Myanmar, and so many other places in the world where there is war. We pray that your kingdom will come, that you will rule with equity and fairness, and that leaders will seek the way of peace. We pray that your will will be done. And so, God, in order for this to happen, we return to praising you day by day so that we are reminded of who you are and how we need to live. Thank you for Jesus. Amen. And now we have a, another song. Refresh My Heart, I believe, is the song that's coming up. And while we sing this song together, the offering will be collected. Thank you.
Lord, with the action of this offering, we tell your story, how you have dealt generously with us, how you have met our needs, how you have heard our prayers, how your goodness is from everlasting to everlasting. Bless these offerings, which are given in the name of Christ. Amen. This is Romans 1, 17. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. That's not all of the second reading. So from now, we will hear a couple of more verses, just single verses, spoken to us in languages other than English. Some of the people who are reading to us are here in the room, Others we will hear via recording. So Aaron, you said you were going to take the microphone around. Let's listen. And if you feel like this is a bit weird because you don't understand a word, well, guess what? That's on purpose. Okay, let's listen. Jess. <laughs> Malmi ama guwonu odot nani igoshi nohe egeso nangoshi anio hananime somurira hengwieso nangoshi aninini inun nugudunji charangshi mothage hami nira. And what language was that, Jess? That was Korean. Okay. I'll read a verse to you in German, and after that we will hear in Dutch, so you can hop over to Tony. Thank you. Denn alle Schrift von Gott eingegeben ist Nütze zur Lehre, zur Zurechtweisung, zur Besserung, und zur Erziehung in der Gerechtigkeit. 
neemt mijn juk op u en leert van mij. Want ik ben zachtmoedig en nederig van hart. En gij zult rust vinden voor uw zielen. Want mijn jok is zacht en mijn hart, mijn last is licht. Thank you. What language is that? Dutch. Exactly. And we've got a few recordings as well. So sit back and listen. Maybe we can hear them later on. Okay. Why did I choose to do that? Why Bible verses in so many different languages? Why choose to have the Bible read to you in language you don't understand? What's that got to do with Martin Luther? Translation, exactly. So the fact that we have the Bible available in so many languages now really goes back to the first, one of the first things that he did. He translated the Latin Bible into the language of the people and of himself. I've got a range of different English translations here as well as other languages. All of that goes back to a decision that Martin Luther made that every, every, every stable boy, he said, every farm boy should be able to read the Bible and know it just like his king or his priest. I'm sure that if Martin Luther hadn't started to translate, other people would have. Don't think it would have been uh, possible for anyone to stop that from happening. However, he was the one who is credited and probably most famous for doing it. There were others. Tyndale in England, for example. So we're talking about Martin Luther today. And I'm going to say Luther and not Luther. Um, because the, the H after the T... In German, it has no, it has no meaning. Of, it, it, it doesn't do anything. So his, his name is Luther, but in English, it comes out as Martin Luther. So don't, don't be confused about that. That's one of the more famous images of him. There are not very many. That's apparently what he looked like. The hat he is wearing is uh, the one that was worn by academics. Martin Luther was a professor of theology. He was a monk. He was a priest, an ordained Catholic priest. He was also a father and a husband, which at the time really didn't go together at all. Because if you were a priest, you would never, ever marry. He did get married as one part of uh, his rebellion against what the church was demanding. And he did get married to a nun who'd run away from her convent because she had heard some of what this new Martin Luther person was teaching and she and several others of the sisters thought that was very interesting. And so they ran away and they met and they got married and they had, they had several children. Very unusual for um, a priest. But as Jacob already um, told us, he got thrown out of the Catholic Church because just, it, it became impossible to keep him in the ranks of the church. So there he is, the rebel, the reformer, the one who started to change things. And he did that mostly in writing. Um, it helped a whole lot that not very long ago, just a few decades before Martin Luther was active, um, a guy called Gutenberg had invented the printing press. So all of a sudden, it became possible for texts to be reproduced in great numbers. It was much, much cheaper to print, and it was much, much cheaper to buy printed materials. That helped spread Luther's ideas immensely. He translated 
as we have already heard, and as for the sort of person that he was, he was a determined person, he was a very, very passionate person, and in the way he communicated and behaved, he was described as rather vehement and blunt. So, is, can I check, is this microphone working? Yeah? Okay. He lived around the year 1500s. In a, was born in a small town in Germany. And at the time, most people were living in what we call these days subsistence farming. So they would grow basically their own food. There was a fair degree of poverty around. Nobility was wealthy. It was the time when some families would start to become rich through trade. But that was not a wealth that spread to others in the population. So most people were really doing it very tough. Um, in that part of Central Europe, in Germany, there were lots and lots of tiny little kingdoms and duchies, small areas overseen by, by earls, by, by little kings. So it was no, there was not a unified German state then. I'm going to show you a map in a minute to give you a sense of, of, of you know, what, a, what a mess it was. So the one, two things that held things together were the language that people shared. You could travel a couple of hundred kilometers and still be understood by people who spoke the same language. And the other thing was the structure of the church. The teachings of the church, the practices, the rituals, of the church. This was Holy Roman Empire. Here is what the area roughly looked like. You can see the, the pink, that's the French Empire. You can see England, Scotland, then over towards the east you've got the green bit, all rather large areas. But if we zoom in, that is what the middle part of Germany looked like. A patchwork of tiny areas. Lots of different rules everywhere. That, however, was what held it in part together. The Catholic Church. I've chosen an image of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome which at that very time was being rebuilt. And underneath I've put a citation that said that Martin Luther contributed more than any other to the subversion of existing conditions in the church. Though Luther only put the match to the inflammable heap which had been accumulating for centuries. Subversion of existing conditions. Sounds really big, doesn't it? However, it all happened, in part, <laughs> in this modest building. That's the tower of the castle of Wittenberg, where Martin Luther was hiding and was doing the work of translating. He had to hide there because after his ideas that as Jacob highlighted, his ideas of what the church was getting so terribly wrong, once these ideas started to spread, the church came after him. With the church, his views were not very popular. With others, they were. So what on earth did he do? He got angry. He got angry at practices that he identified as exploitative. That mostly had to do with a thing called indulgences. 
What are indulgences? Yeah. Yes, you have to pay money, a fee, to get a piece of paper that said that your sins were forgiven and that you would now, because of the money that you had paid, have to spend a, I don't know, a couple of days, a couple of months, a couple of years less in the purifying fire that awaited you after death. And where you would be punished for the sins, get this, for the sins that were already forgiven through confession. So when you went to confession back then and the priest would listen to your confession and forgive you those things, they were sort of forgiven then, but you would still know that the moment you die, you would go into the purging fire and you would have to pay the punishment that would still await you for the sins that had already been forgiven while you were alive. That's a double bind, isn't it? You know, how, can you, how can you possibly get out of that? But that was what was taught to people. And guess where the money went? Yeah. So for the church at that time, selling indulgences was very, very profitable. Luther thought of all of that as terribly mistaken theology and wrong teaching, heresy. Don't know that he used that word, but wrong teaching based on wrong assumptions and incorrect interpretation of scripture. That is what we mean when we use the word heresy. So he got angry and he started to challenge the authority of this pope and of the teaching of the church to the people. But then again, how come he did that? What was it that made him go, I'm going to go and have to do something about it? Three things. Firstly, he saw, he observed what what these practices, these messages were doing to people. He was a priest. People would come to him to confess. He saw people in the street. He knew how scared people were of God, how much dread they had in their lives, knowing that there was this, this God who apparently was enormously intent on punishing them. And there seemed to be no way out. And if you were poor, well, you know, even tougher. You just have to suffer a couple of thousand years longer before you finally make it into heaven. He saw what this teaching did. And he found it terrible. And he found it cynical. There was... Uh, what I've got there in bold print, that is one of the slogans that these indulgence preachers would say publicly in the marketplace to encourage people to buy indulgences. As soon as the gold in the casket rings, the rescued soul into heaven springs. Wow, what a message to hear. So uh, next to it, a little bit in white, that, that, is, that is an indulgence. It's in German, I, I can read it, and it says, in, in the full authority of all the saints and in mercy towards you, I absolve you of all your sins and your misdeeds, and I um, forgive you all punishment to the tune of 10 days. So that was a modest indulgence, but at least, you know, Ten, ten days less. That can't be right. Let me make a comment here. In all that, that we're reflecting upon, and that certainly all that I am talking about, I am not bashing the Roman Catholic Church. I think we all agree that Catholics are 
our siblings in Christ. What we're critical of here is the misunderstood application of Scripture and of how it was misused to keep people small and simply to earn money. So that's what Luther saw and he didn't like it. And secondly, Martin Luther felt himself what this teaching did. He felt how these teachings and his own recurring doubts impacted his own view of God, his own faith, his trust in God. Martin agonized, really agonized over his sense of inadequacy, his sense of standing hopeless of salvation before his God. And he was a priest. How could he have such doubt when his job was to speak relief to the people? He found he could just not do it. And I want you to hear what he himself said. I was indeed a pious monk and kept the rules of my order so strictly that I can say, if ever a monk gained heaven through monkery, it should have been I. All my monastic brethren who knew me will testify to this. I would have martyred myself to death with fasting, praying, reading and other good works had I remained a monk much longer. My conscience could never achieve certainty but was always in doubt and said, you have not done this correctly. You were not contrite enough. You omitted this in your confession. Therefore, the longer I tried to heal my uncertain, weak and troubled conscience with human traditions, the more uncertain, weak and troubled I continually made it. If I could believe that God was not angry with me, I would stand on my head for joy. I sincerely hope that none of you is now in a state in your life at a place in your faith where you wonder what more it takes for God to love you. Do I need to, you know, more of this, more confession, more soul searching, longer prayers? Apparently, Luther would confess up to six hours every single day and still he would just not know in his heart that God was good and that he was saved and that he was forgiven. It's a dreadful place to be in. And so finally, after seeing and feeling for himself, he started wondering. And he started wondering how his own internal response to what he heard and what he felt, what that was leading him to. And he decided, what a moment of glory, he decided to search the scriptures for an answer. And in doing that, he finally found his main question. How can I find a merciful God? Because he knew in his heart that that was what the scripture was talking about. But he just could not feel it. And so he set out to search. And I want to lead you briefly through what he did because it is a fantastic example of what to do when you've got a hunch that something is not right. So, at the time, Luther was teaching at university. He was teaching a course on the Psalms. And one Psalm 
was Psalm 71. And in there it says, In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, rescue me and deliver me. And he continues on. And he noticed, if you remember the psalm that Kay read to us before, sing to the Lord in you, song, sing, praise everyone, because God has saved us. Even the trees and the rivers clap and sing. Luther went, hang on. All of that language around the God of righteousness is good. There is so much joy. I'm not feeling it. Where, where is this God that the scriptures are speaking of? And he went to have a really good look. And he came to read Romans. And we've heard that verse, Romans 1, 16 and 17. Kay read it, the first one, where it says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God and to salvation to everyone, everyone who believes. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Very important moment. So Psalm 71 says, God's righteousness is a rock, is a fortress, is good. Romans 1, 16, 17 says, salvation is by faith. That's scripture. The church says, mm, well, no, salvation is through what you do. The harder you try, the more hope you have that maybe it'll work out in your favor. So that was the aha moment that led Luther to this beautiful moment. Again, in Luther's own words, at last, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, I turned to the following words. Here they are again. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. As it is written, he who through faith, faith is righteous, will live. There I began to understand the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous people live through a gift of God, namely by faith. And this is the meaning. The righteousness of God, which is revealed in the gospel, is a, a passive righteousness, one that you receive, one for which you do nothing, with which the merciful God justifies us by faith as it is written. He who through faith is righteous shall live. And then he says, here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. I've got goosebumps as I'm reading this out. Isn't that fantastic? What a revelation. What a, mo a moment of salvation, a moment of knowing that, yes, you are good with God. Yes, God's love, God's faith in you, God's righteousness himself, that is enough because through Christ you have it and that is all that is required. Nothing else will get you any closer to God, to the merciful God. There he was, the merciful God. And here are the verses that we've heard in other languages and they all so sum up, they all are the foundation of what we owe to Martin Luther. The just shall live by faith. Romans 1.17. Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It is not the result of works. So that no one can boast that theology, that message had been there for a thousand five hundred years, but it had been lost. All scripture, it says, 
is inspired by God. It is good and useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in this righteousness. So if it is there, let's use it. Oh, hang on, people can't because... Because the Bible was written in Latin and no one spoke Latin. Not even then. Latin was already a dead language. So, oh, here's an idea, right? Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart. So what's all of this harshness around? You will find rest for my souls in me, says Jesus. Not in what you do, not in crawling up the steps of St. Peter's on bloody knees. That is not going to do the trick. It's the presence and the person of Christ who says that my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Were the people carrying a light and gentle burden? Oh goodness, no, they were not. So something was wrong. Living like stones, scripture also says, let yourself then build, all of you, all of you people, into a spiritual house, into, into a temple, into this, this fortress that, that, that can withstand the evil. Be, all of you, be a holy priesthood, every person. Be a holy priesthood together and offer spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. What a different message. And it had been sitting there all along. It just needed to be recovered. So I think the main legacy of Martin Luther that is super important today as it was 500 years ago is what Theologians would call the doctrine of justification by faith alone. That's, that's fancy for saying God loves you because he loves you because he loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. And there's nothing that you have to do to gain that. It is not achieved. It is simply received as a present that God wants you to know about. And Luther said, whoever departs from this article of justification does not know God. That's a, that's a harsh thing to say. And you understand why he was eventually thrown out of the church when in that beautiful place called Worms, <laughs> he would not take it back. Yeah, maybe you've heard You've heard uh, that phrase, and we've sort of sung a version of it. Here I stand, he said, when he was accused again. He said, here I stand. I cannot say anything else, but that my conscience is bound by what, by what I read in Scripture. And here it says, faith is all it takes for us to be saved, to know that we are saved. I cannot and I will not take it back. And off he went. To start a movement of renewal in the church. And as a consequence of that, there are now things like the Uniting Church of Australia and the Churches of Christ and the Baptist Movement and the Methodist Church and the United Methodist Church and all of that goes back to Martin Luther who let us all know that what we should do if we have a question, if there is something that is puzzling us, if something is not working out, go to the scriptures and search diligently, prayerfully, with discernment. And whatever position you, come, you, you end up holding, it must be grounded in scripture. And weirdly, that means that as Protestant Christians today, we can have a range of views that are not the same, but we all can say, we believe this because this is what it says in our sacred book, and this is how we understand it, and this is how we live it. 
We're all making this promise to God and to one another. So, what is Luther's legacy? That is one. This understanding of justification through the grace of God by our faith. Let me jump over these. Oops. What did he do in addition to that? Well, we've got thousands and thousands of Protestant churches in the world now. We've got Bible translations, different versions for children's Bibles, for Bibles in love, everything, because we know that we can do that. The point is we want people to be able to open themselves to the word of God and you have to be able to understand it. We owe to Martin Luther this theology of grace and faith, the, the, the uncovering of, of this message that had always been there. We owe to him also uh, the model of married pastors. They have never happened before. Since then, it's very normal in very many denominations and movements. Female pastors, in a way, also go back to Martin Luther because he allowed everyone to read and understand and speak about it. We sing in church because, again, Martin Luther thought that that was a wonderful way to get the message out and to empower everyone to know the stories and to know scripture, to know what we believe in through singing. The priesthood of all believers, I've mentioned that before. Schooling. How can we make sure that a large number of people are able to read by teaching them how to? So from Luther onwards, public schools became a thing and maybe even the Methodist revival later on in England. It was a text that Luther wrote about the book of Romans that led John Wesley to that moment of saying, I found my heart strangely warmed. So there was um, another moment of, of salvation, of knowing that God loves us. So I encourage all of you to remember the example of Luther, to know for sure that our message is a message of grace. It's not one of harshness, not one of a punishing God. We can use his example as one where someone read the room and responded well. And someone observed what was going on and what seemed needed. We have the example of someone who searched for God, who had this conviction in him that there is a good God. Oh yes, absolutely there is. And lastly, Ecclesia Semper Reformanda. The church is always in need of being reformed. And if it is only um, by the addition of <laughs> new air conditioning units. <laughs> Let's think. Let's think about what we do. Let's be aware of where we ground ourselves and let us make sure, and that for me, with or despite all that I've said, for me, that is the main lesson that I take from Martin Luther. Let's empower one another. Let us help one another know, help one another understand the God who we believe in. We all can. Amen. If you want to stand again, let's do that and sing about Christ, who is our cornerstone, the one on, on whom everything rests. Stand and sing.
Then I trust the sweetest friend But holy trust in Jesus' name Come on, every voice My hope is built on nothing less Than Jesus' blood and righteousness The sweetest friend, but holy trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, Christ alone, we can make it strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He righteousness alone we can know that we stand absolutely fortunately God loves you because he loves you because he loves you and there's nothing you can do about it let us go with this message to love God and to love and serve one another Amen <laughs>